Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the stage Mr. J.D. Dawson. My story begins on a typically warm Southern California day. Uh, my wife and I were at a friend's baby shower, and we were sitting at a table with a group of randos. Nobody knew who anybody was, and engaging in small talk. I had found out that the gentleman sitting across from me, Evan, was a surgeon in an emergency room, an honest-to-God fucking trauma surgeon. Now, in my young life at that point, I had never met a doctor, let alone a real surgeon who saves you know, human lives in the wild before, so I was impressed. And so eventually, um, he asked me what I did, and I replied with a certain amount of nonchalance. I work at Playboy. Now, I've gotten used to the look of awe from my young cousins when I tell them about my time working at Playboy, but I was not quite prepared for the level of admiration and a little bit of envy that a trauma surgeon showed towards my career choices. <laughs> the conversation kind of went like this. <laughs> you work at Playboy? Well, yeah, I mean, I work for Playboy TV. I produce TV shows for Playboy TV. Are the playmates everywhere? <laughs> well, yeah, they're like the hosts of the shows and the stars and everything, so we see them all the time, you know, meetings in the morning. We all eat in the same cafeteria. You know, general work stuff, but with playmates. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's totally professional. You are my god. <laughs> like, my career path had just <laughs> brought a trauma surgeon down to his knees. <laughs> it was kind of awesome. Um, I started working at Playboy, uh, Playboy TV in 2003. And when I first started working there, it was kind of like this guy had dreamed about it. It was awesome. All right, Playboy at that time did a lot of like cheesecake shows, you know, titty jiggling, sexual farce, you know, fun time, ooh, ooh you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and it was all great. And there were gorgeous women everywhere and actually having conversations with men who chose to spend their lives chained to computers in dark rooms. Um, every Wednesday, uh, the first Wednesday of every month, they handed out the magazine, so that was awesome. There's a guy coming by with a big old trolley cart, and he's got Playboys, like, Playboys, here, yeah, you know? And everybody came out and got their Playboy. And he spent the day looking through, being like, oh, she's kind of cute, oh, she's kind of cute, and then spent the rest of the day actually reading the articles. <laughs> um, and then... Also, Fridays were awesome, because Fridays were not only beer day, but they were weed day. And it was also the day that they shot the show called The Weekend Flash. The Weekend Flash was Playboy's idea of combining the daily show with the naked news. And so anybody who worked on the show was allowed to go into the production area, and it was just naked ladies, naked playmate ladies. It was awesome. However, all of this was also very expensive. And after about a year of it, the business model had to change. <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> um, so a lot of you may not, I mean a lot of you, most of you may not know this or care to know this, but Playboy not only owns Playboy TV, but they also own all of the hardcore porn that is played on on-demand cable and also all the hardcore porn that's played on-demand in hotel rooms. So like while the, um, you know, while the storefront window at Playboy is, you know, promoting a tasteful, appreciation of the female form, where they're really making their money is in the back door by making sure that every slutty hole is filled with hard cock. <laughs> um, so after I worked there for a year, um, you know, everything was great, but then Playboy decided that they needed to change the business model and like harder and edgier content needed to be the focus. So we switched to hardcore porn. Um, switching to hardcore porn was not really that difficult of a choice. Um, it kind of parallels the way a lot of women get into porn in that, you know, I came to L.A. with nothing but a suitcase full of dreams. I started working, doing some risque work, uh, you know, someone to feed the bills and pay the kids. And, um, and then when they asked me if I wanted to do some, you know, some harder stuff, I was like, well, you know, everything is so nice and the people are so cool. I didn't, it didn't really seem like much of a stretch. So next thing you know, I'm a hardcore porn editor. <laughs> Um, the first show I cut for Playboy was a show called Naughty Amateur Home Videos. Naughty Amateur Home Videos was 
a show where they had like a, you know, a sexy, fun, perky hostess introducing a series of clips that um, were designed to look like the viewers had sent them in. Um, so it was all very homemade. Now I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that make like, you know, very tasteful, erotic, homemade porn. That was not the goal of this show. The goal of the show was to convince you that it was real. So therefore, nobody used a video camera that was made before 1984. It was grainy. Second, no lighting. So when you watch a normal porn, there's like lights everywhere. There's lights on the camera so that whenever they're up there like, you know, showing the stuff going on, um, you, you get to see it and it's all really brightly lit. And so imagine the opposite. So, you know, we all have these like dark places on our body, but when it's really brightly lit, it's awesome. But when it's not brightly lit and it's filmed on a camera that was made in the Stone Age, like those dark areas are just these creepy, menacing, awful things that I'm sure <laughs> everybody remembers when they accidentally walked in on mom and dad having sex that one night. <laughs> However, I was a professional. And I cut these things with the same amount of commitment to craft that Walter Murch cut Apocalypse Now. <laughs> For instance, and nobody else did this, um, if the penis was going in on the wide shot, um, I made sure when I cut to the close-up that it matched not only in direction, but in depth. So if it was here, at the cut, it was here. All right, that's important, because, I mean, if I'm watching a porn, and I like all of a sudden I see the penis and it's all like brum, 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 totally gonna lose my boner. <laughs> so, so I made sure that that shit was seamless. Um, another thing that I did that I felt separated, you know, my artistic wheat from the common chaff, was uh, I was always certain to include the queefs. And pun intended, I would kind of goose the audio so that like the queef was the thing that you heard when the queef was going down. Um, which, nobody else did that. And so it always prompted the question, like, yo, JD, why are you including the queefs all the time? And I was like, well, because queefs are hot. I mean, they're real. I mean, okay, we all watch porn, and porn is kind of just filled with ridiculous hyperbole, where essentially you've got some woman laying on her back, spread eagle, doing, <laughs> it was like, her best Gilbert Gottfried impression there. And she's like, oh, that cock is so good! Oh my God, that cock is amazing! Oh! Like, it's, it's bullshit. <laughs> but you, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't fake a queef, you know? <laughs> Queefs are realsies, and realsies equals hot. <laughs> um, another, so another thing that I did while working at, um, a lot of people ask me, like, is working in porn, like, how is it different from working in another place? And it's really not much different than any other place you work. Everybody goes to work at the same time. Everybody gathers around the water cooler and talks about football or SNL or whatever. You know, we eat lunch at Subway, we go home at six. So it's kind of no different, except for the fact that there's hardcore porn everywhere. I mean, everywhere, any flat surface where dust could collect, there's hardcore porn. I mean, you walk into somebody's cubicle, and there's posters on the sidewalls, there's clips that they're previewing on the monitor, and of course, there's DVDs just strewn everywhere. And so it's really interesting to have a conversation with somebody, say, about something as uninteresting as frame rates or delivery specifications, while you're looking at the back of, like, you know, take a look at me now, Dad 7. And it's just like this this panacea of debauchery. And so your mind is like compartmentalizing this where it's like, fuck. Oh yeah, 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 2997, no worries, we got that. Oh, international delivery, cool. Fuck. <laughs> but nobody, like you don't turn to the guy and be like, what the fuck is up with this? Like nobody, nobody talks about it. It's like everybody's cool with porn. <laughs> but we're all like going, fuck. <laughs> um, another thing that I did for Playboy is in the whole thing of like sending out the videos to hotel rooms is I would sanitize triple X movies and break them down to the different qualifications of X and double X. Um, 
what was interesting is that we had a document, a PDF that we would print out that was a chart that listed everything that was allowable in X, double X, and triple X. Um, most of this stuff was, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar, or I'm not familiar with, but I'm sure it makes sense. Like in a single X movie, you can't show any penetration and you can't show any genitals. So essentially the single X movies are the ones that you buy on demand and you get pissed off because somebody has taken out everything interesting and just repeated like that one shot 15 times and then they cut to the dude and he's like, Ugh! and then they fade to black on a candle or something. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're welcome for that. <laughs> um, but what was interesting is there was also a rating called X.5. So X.5 or X and a half still can't show penetration. You know, you can't show finishing or anything, but you can now show the naughty bits. Um, however, there was this crazy rule in which if you're going to show a close-up of an erect penis, it can be on screen for no longer than seven seconds. <laughs> Nobody understood this rule. Like, if that doesn't reek of some sort of boardroom arbitration lawyer bullshit, I don't know what does. Like, I can imagine the conversation is kind of being like, you know, there's a group of lawyers in the room, and they're, they're from all the different quadrants of the country, and they're deciding what is acceptable and what's not. And there's some, like, fucking redneck Texas motherfucker who's just, like, rationalized in his mind, if I got a boner, and I look at another boner, and it's not on screen for more than, like, seven seconds, then I'm not gay either. So fucking seven seconds. <laughs> you know, and everybody's like, all right, cool, seven seconds. I mean, it was a ridiculous rule, but it did lead to what was probably the dumbest professional argument I've ever had in my career. <laughs> and the argument went something like this. A producer came into the room, we were talking about the notes for one of my episodes, and he's all, yo, JD, bro, what the fuck? I mean, bro, because producers are douchebags. Anyways, <laughs> yo, JD, bro, you've got like a 15 second cock in there, what's the deal? And I said this with as much, <laughs> I just, as pretentious as I could be, I was like, um, excuse me, but I went to film school, graduated BFA, and I can assure you that that shot is not a close up, um, but a medium close up. <laughs> Cutting to a close up at this moment would not make any sort of sense and be ridiculous for narrative structure. <laughs> Since it's not a close-up, I can keep the penis on screen for as long as I want. <laughs> so, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> that cock is big, that cock is hard, and that cock is illegal. Cut it down to 6.5 seconds so we can all go home. Philistines. <laughs> Um, so, as I'm telling this story, a lot of you might wonder if I, what I actually did was work. Because you're like, well, I fucking work at, look at porn all the time. I don't get paid for it. Why are you up here talking about working at porn? Well, there's a distinct difference <laughs> the way you all muggles look at porn and the way the professionals have to deal with it. <laughs> and here's the difference. Um, when you look at porn, it, you know, you're looking at it, you're enjoying it, whatever. If you stumble across something that you're not into, you move on. I never got that luxury. <laughs> All right, I had to fucking sit there and watch whatever it was. And everybody's into their own shit. But if you're not into something, you don't have to watch it. I did. Um, and it was crazy because, like, you have to watch some shit that's, I mean, just some crazy shit that, again, some people like, some people don't. Like, there was this one scene I was cutting, and, um, you know, cutting along. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, but the thing is, is I didn't just watch it. Like, I had to actually pay attention to it. Because, you know, all the stuff that I talked about with the single X and the X.5, we had to cut all that shit out. And you had to make multiple versions. So you have to watch the thing multiple times and cut it multiple times. So, you know, you have to watch it and make sure there's no penises in this one and no fluids in this one and no butt stuff in anything but triple X. And this clip happened to be chock full of butt stuff. Butt stuff is cool. But this bus stuff, it was these two just tragic girls who were in a lesbian scene, and the lesbian scene eventually evolved into 
they pulled out dildos and they started to just jam them into each other's asses and jam them into her asses and then lubricate them in their mouths and then back into this ass and then back into this ass and like here and behind the back and just, it was just ass to mouth insanity. And it went on for 45 minutes. Okay, 45 minutes, no big deal, but 45 minutes is eight hours of work for me. So for eight hours, I'm dealing with this clip and I'm not into it. And it was crazy because I got mad. I got mad at the screen. And I started screaming at the screen as I would continue to edit this. And they just keep going back and forth. Back and forth. Oh, yeah, your ass is so good. Oh, your fucking ass is good. What? Take them, boy. And I'm just like, and I'm, and I'm screaming. I'm like, fucking knock it off, girls. For Christ's sake, just fucking finish. And it just went on and on. And I'm screaming. And I'm screaming. I'm like, ah! <laughs> I mean, it's weird, because like, I've never had an angry reaction at porn. I'm never like, fuck you, porn. <laughs> but this time I was. And that was not the one clip. Like, this was, this was three, four times a week. You've got to just cut shit that you don't like. And you've got to rationalize that it's content. And that's fine. You can sit here and say, oh, yeah, it's content. Whatever, fucking content. I just, I'm going to work. I'm going to work. But it affects you. And it pisses you off. And it's weird to kind of like be trapped by time and this thing, um, which is probably like working in insurance, but I don't know. <laughs> so maybe it's really no different. Um, but so like that was the only negative side to working in porn. Everything else about it was awesome. The money was awesome. The people were awesome. And I got to go to the Playboy Mansion for the Christmas party, which was sweet. <laughs> And besides, I mean, how many of us have actually made a trauma surgeon jealous by their career choice? Thank you. 